I'm Zachary Cartwright. This is Water and Food. You know, our challenge is how to do that in the, in the right way with the funding we have. And we felt good about our process, but we didn't feel 100% really secure about everything we were doing. You know, we want to make sure we deliver consistency to people, the knowledge of the isotherm and, and really integrating our water activity meter into our process. It just gave us so much more confidence in what we were delivering to the customers. Water has been called the luck of the planet by Daniel Burston, and its impact and significance are evident everywhere in the foods that we eat. Every year, billions of dollars are spent by food manufacturers to move water in and out of food products. As a food scientist, I am on a mission to understand how this can be done better. Today, I'm joined by Michael Pan in Portland, Oregon. He is the creator of Pan's Mushroom Jerky, a plant-based alternative snack to traditional meat jerkies. From taking a very novel approach for product development to cultivating desired tastes and textures, Michael has been able to scale his production and improve his process measurements in a fascinating way. Let's hear what he has to say on water and food. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm great. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about your product. This is one of my favorite products. It's a, a great snack food. So let's jump straight into it. Uh, you and your company is known for its mushroom jerky. Uh, tell me about that and where this idea came from. Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, thanks for having me on. It really means a lot as we're as a uh, startup and emerging company. It always it's fantastic to be able to have an opportunity to talk about uh, where we started and how we how we've gotten here. So, mm -hmm. thank you for that. And yeah, I mean, basically the some context about myself. Um, so my mom is actually she's from Peru, and my my dad's born and raised in a small fishing village in Malaysia. And so uh, when he was fourteen, he ended up immigrating to the U.S. And worked as well. He didn't know any English, um, mm -hmm. and managed to work his way all the way through to college. And I'm actually uh, born and raised in Mississippi, and I know I certainly sound like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and while I absolutely loved growing up in Mississippi, I always felt disconnected from my family heritage. And so I loved visiting extended family and just learning as much as I could about my culture. And during one of these visits to Malaysia. Um, there's a bowl of food on the table. I reach in and try it. I actually think it was pork. I thought it was pork and I was like, oh, this is really good. What is this? But I was really confused because my cousin or my family, they're vegetarian Buddhists. Mm -hmm. So it didn't make sense. And I quickly learned that what I was eating was a mushroom. And so I found out that as that he'd been making this snack for himself, for his family, for friends and, and selling it locally. And as vegetarians, they had trouble finding foods that not only really tasted good, but they also also finding foods that had a really satisfying textures. And they found the mushrooms were satisfying and also very healthy. Mm -hmm. And so this opened my eyes to this amazing culture that used innovative foods and ingredients to mimic the taste and texture of meat. And so when I found that out, I fell in love with the product. I fell in love with its history. And yeah, at that point, I just knew we, our family had this snack that had to be shared with other people in the rest of the world. And that's when I actually decided to launch Pan's uh, Mushroom Jerky back in 2008, actually, believe it or not. But yeah, mm -hmm. um, that's how we started. And um, from what I've heard online and from all my colleagues, you know, we, we love this product. Tell me a little bit about that R&D process and what it really took to nail those flavors and get the texture that you want. Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. I actually don't have a food background at all. Uh, my mm -hmm. engineering background is actually in, in engineering. So luckily, you know, from some of that experience where you always have to, you have to figure things out and iterate and test, you know, I was able to kind of leverage some of that experience. But uh, in addition, I also had, um, I was lucky I had kind of a base family recipe that I was able to start from. And while that was great, I, I had to put in a lot of work to um, make it for, you know, make it a product of my own and, and update ingredients to the standards that I wanted. And, and at the time, actually, my, my, my family is vegetarian. So they actually had egg, egg whites in it. I didn't want that. I wanted more, uh, you know, completely vegan and plant-based. So I spent a lot of time, <laughs> like a lot of people Googling and just trying to understand, you know, what people use instead of things like eggs or whatever we were using just to find out, yeah, what, what kind of ingredients would be best and, and uh, would, would still keep that taste and texture we wanted. So to answer your question, it, it, you know, I didn't go out and I didn't have the bandwidth to go, you know, find the best food scientists in the world. Um, mm -hmm. 
I had to learn it myself and, and just self-taught and, and just a ton of iterations and cooking. So, yeah, that, that's pretty amazing. So no food science background, no culinary background. Uh, so you just must be a really determined person, <laughs> <I think>. uh, <laughs> but, but that's good for all of us uh, who are consuming your product. Um, what other challenges did you face as you went from your family kitchen to going to large scale production and, and dealing with things like shipping and packaging and, and all these other hurdles that you must have come across? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I tell people all the time who are starting off, I'm like, hey, this, you know, you have a great idea. It sounds awesome. Actually executing and doing it is a whole, obviously another thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was very happy when we, you know, kind of nailed down our recipe, nailed down kind of the basics of how we wanted to make this. But yes, yeah, scaling and and figuring out how to actually get it out to market was a whole different story. And in very similar fashion, you know, I never built a food company, never built, you know, something that, you know, from scratch like that. And I just kind of had to learn as I go, as I went, but uh, luckily this food community in the Northwest and, and we're in Portland, Oregon, uh, there's a lot of people that are very willing to help kind of whether it's, whether it's how do you create account on ups.com all the way to, Hey, we have some three PLs that we think could be a good fit for you. Um, there's someone I feel like that you can always reach out to around here that'll help uh, in those mm -hmm. facets. So it was a combination of, you know, be will being willing to learn it and make mistakes and then, you know, continue evolving after I learned what not to do. Um, and also just trying to leverage uh, and build a network here in the Northwest to to use their experience and, and learn from their mistakes that they've had as well. But yeah, it's very challenging. And we're still we're still in the middle of how do we uh, scale our business. And I think every stage we're learning right now is great. We got out of the shared kitchen situation. Fantastic. You have to kind of think ahead three to four to six months. All right. Well, we've hit this certain sales and, and volume. Great. How do we get to the, the next tier? And we're always, I, I'm now learning that we're always kind of chasing since we are bootstrapped. Um, you know, it's challenging to get too far ahead. So that's something we're definitely still kind of figuring out a bit, but we're, we're happy to say that we did move into a, from a shared kitchen situation to our own facility and a uh, 4,000 square facility, which isn't huge, mm -hmm. but you know, it's our own. And we're right. able to do that after about a year and a half after launching. So. Well, well congrats. That's awesome. You know, just step-by-step. Step. Um, it's great to be a part of this and, and get to watch you. Um, and, and I agree with you. It seems like people in our area in the Pacific Northwest are always willing uh, to, to lend a hand and, and to help you get where you're trying to go. Um, you know, this this podcast is about water and food. So I, I want to hear about <laughs> the water in, in this mushroom jerky and what kind of challenges uh, you were faced with and, and when you decided to um, bring water activity into the equation. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something that it's kind of interesting. I feel like we were flying blind a little bit in terms of how uh, much water activity we had. Mm -hmm. And while I think we didn't have the funds necessary to go invest too heavily in that side of things, we were small enough and, and which honestly allowed us to kind of figure out what worked for us to get our water activity down uh, to a certain level. As you can imagine in the jerky category, um, and I think even meat producers, meat jerkies and any kind of dried goods always struggles with that, right? And our 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 situation was we just, we had to do kind of <laughs> a little off of taste and feel versus actually knowing a number. And it was very, very challenging. Luckily, we did have some, a couple of key points where we did work with people like the Food Innovation Center to help us get in a, a you know, kind of a, a baseline of where we're at with the current processes. So they really helped us just make sure that, okay, for the most part, if we do this, we think we're here. And once we kind of, you know, got the ball rolling and started getting more sales and making larger batches, you know, we really just justified and also uh, were able to get the funds we needed to actually start investing further. And, and that's obviously when we reached out to you guys and tried to figure out how do we, you know, how do we actually start having more controls in place to test per batch? How do we make sure that we ensure that our processes are uh, meeting our water activity expectations? And we couldn't be happier with, uh, with how that worked out with you guys. And then beyond water activity, were isotherms also a part of your process? And, and what insight did those give you into your product? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's something that um, luckily um, your group helped us with. I have no experience in isotherms at all, <laughs> nor did I really know 
what that was, to be honest with you. And, and, you know, it wasn't until after, you know, meeting with you all and just really talking through all our steps and what we're challenges we're facing. And, you know, you guys shed the light on what I was missing out on. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think, I think it just, you know, there's a, there's a difference between uh, how we were, which was, you know, we're making a product and just shipping it out. And we, we felt, we felt good about what we were making. We had great feedback, but when you hit a certain scale, that's where we're at now is, you know, we, we know that, um, you know, we want to make sure we deliver consistency to people and uh, the isotherm and, and the meters that you guys provided us really just helped us nail down actual steps in our process to make our production processes easier and more consistent. Mm-hmm. And so I learned a lot. I'm still learning. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's been a very huge benefit for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's always more to learn. Uh, even me and in, in my position, I'm constantly learning. You know, there's so many unique products like yours that we deal with. And so for me, it, it's enjoyable because it's a discovery process for myself as well. So what would you say are the most immediate benefits that you had once you started using water activity and isotherms in your process? I would say, honestly, almost a peace of mind mm-hmm. in, in a broad sense. We, you know, like I said before, we were... I think the best way to put it is we were flying blind a bit. We felt good about our process, but we didn't feel 100% really secure about everything we were doing. And and then we, you know, every so often we found that we were just getting inconsistent batches. And luckily with the the knowledge of the isotherm and, and really integrating our water activity meter into our process, it just gave us so much more confidence in what we were delivering to the customers. And, you know, we did have some batches that would unfortunately, uh, would, would spoil and go bad earlier than we expected. And we had to find it out the hard way. Um, Mm -hmm. and luckily we weren't huge at this, at that point, but now we feel much more confident when we ship a batch out that, uh, you know, it's within our standards of, of how long it should last on the shelf. And, um, we're straight, we're seeing that benefit now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a, a huge cost associated whenever you have those types of issues. Um, and so this is the hope for any business that we work with at Meter is, is helping to reduce the amount of rework or, or batches that have to be called back. Um, but for you, what are the next steps for your business and, and what's the future hold for, for yourself and for your company? <laughs> yeah, no, we, um, we're, we're, we're excited. I think we, we've kind of gotten out of this mode of um, you know, I would say out of this proof of, proof of concept mode, out of out of launch essentially, and we're at the very beginning of, um, which is exciting, very very beginning of how do we scale the business? And you know, luckily we're in a very exciting category in plant based, uh, and and jerky itself is kind of it's kind of flatlined a bit in terms of meat, but uh, mm-hmm. the plant based jerky uh, set is is growing tremendously, and so we see huge opportunity to capture that market. And not only that, we're seeing obviously vegan and plant-based vegetarian has evolved from just a niche kind of lifestyle. And it's now really about people who are becoming more aware of all the benefits of reducing meat in general. So whether that's because of health concerns, safety, animal welfare, uh, people are starting to realize the impact of uh, reducing their meat intake. And we're happy to you know try to ride that wave. So you know, our next steps are how to capture that market. How do we capture those people and, and enable them to live that lifestyle where they don't have to always grab a meat jerky and they can see the benefits of uh, not only reducing their meat, but also um, adding mushrooms to their diet on a daily basis. And, you know, our challenge is how to do that in the, in the right way with the funding we have and a daily challenge, <laughs> as you can imagine, <laughs> but we're, we're excited mm-hmm. about it. So, and especially given the, the crazy year that everyone's had with COVID, we're very lucky to be able to be operating and, and still growing. Mm-hmm. And are, are you investigating any other foods besides mushrooms for your jerky or, or just sticking to mushrooms for now? Sticking to mushrooms for now. I think we, we have enough uh, market to cover for, for the time being. And mushrooms are just amazing. <laughs> almost It's almost a thing. It's, it's not just food. It's they you know, people are consider them almost living things as well. And um, we are excited to obviously continue building our current products out, but we have some other exciting things we have in the, in the works to utilize mushrooms for other, other products, but we have uh, some things to do first. 
<laughs> There's always more to do. Mm -hmm. Are you using a, a certain type of mushroom or are you using a mixture of mushrooms or, or what's that process look like? Yeah, um, we are using shiitake mushrooms and, and we've tried, what's amazing, obviously there's there's so many types of mushrooms out there for all different types of benefits, whether it's reishi, lion's mane, and, and those are fantastic mushrooms. Because of our use case of just trying to get, you know, a jerky-like texture, uh, we have found that shiitakes kind of nail that um, more than any other mushroom for our our process and 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 develop and our process and our our recipe. We've tried other other mushrooms to do it, and it just fell short of what we wanted. Uh, while those there are health benefits to all those other types, we just couldn't quite get it um, the same texture that we wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so shiitakes have been kind of the main fungi uh, from day one. So. Mm -hmm. So you got you got your mushroom picked out. Uh, how did you decide on your flavors and, and what current flavors are available? And also, which is your favorite flavor? Oh, man, they're all they're all like my my children. It's always a tough question <laughs> for me. Yeah, so we we have four flavors today. And, you know, it's a, it was the way we developed was kind of a combination of, you know, make trying to figure out what works best with our process a bit, what's somewhat easily manufacturable. We didn't want to add ingredients or flavors that made it very challenging. I think if we, you know, some, some flavors may be more sticky, for instance, or something, and, and, you know, that presents some challenges when producing, but uh, we wanted a, a wide variety that, you know, obviously pushed the palate, but also we understand that mushroom jerky is a very new concept. That's a bit weird to some people. So we, we leaned on kind of using um, approachable flavors and one of them being like an apple barbecue, it's kind of a, a very approachable flavor for a lot of people who don't quite know what to expect. Uh, it's just simple, sweet and smoky. We also have a salt and pepper, which, you know, you put salt and pepper on almost anything and the right amount, it can make any meal really, really tasty. So that's, you know, it's a basic flavor that I think is approachable. And then we have our um, uh, zesty Thai, which actually is my favorite. It's the first one we developed. Love Thai food like a lot of people. And we tried to find the right balance of, you know, how spicy is too spicy how you know we don't we didn't we didn't want to get too spicy but we wanted a bit of a spice to come out um and so we we're very lucky to to i think nail that flavor uh, and that's been my favorite and it's actually our best selling flavor and then lastly we have an original flavor which is pretty much has the most umami and shiitake mushroom flavor that comes out very simple ingredient set there's only five ingredients and it's really just the kind of the people who love mushrooms would like that flavor typically the most because it just has more of the shiitake mushroom flavor comes out. And someone listening to the this podcast, where can they find uh, Pan's mushroom jerky? Yeah, so if obviously online, you can find us on Amazon. Our website is mushroomjerky.com, pretty simple. You can also find us on Thrive Market as well. And on the retail side, we are at Whole Foods in the Pacific Northwest and in the California, Southern California area. And as well as New Seasons, Mark of Choice, uh, and a lot of the co-ops around the area as well. But we do ship to a number of, you're listening on the East Coast, for instance, we are at Mom's Market, Midwest, we're at Hy-Vee, for instance. We're also natural grocers. So we have some um, scattered retailers around the country, mostly in the natural side of things. But we're working on uh, obviously getting more retail presence at the moment as well. So we got an exciting 2021 coming up. Mm -hmm. And then my last question for you is, if someone is out there listening and they're in the same shoes as you or maybe a, a few steps behind you and they're working on a new novel product, what advice would you give to that person? Wow. One <laughs> piece of advice. I don't know if I could give one piece of advice. Or a few. Um, no, no. I, I would say, you know, I think I think it's uh, important to, I, I think I would say two things. Number one, you know, I had, again, I had no background in food. So I had to you know, kind of leverage what I could learn on, on the internet, but also obviously leverage whoever I could meet. And I was trying to be as aggressive as I could to meet other food manufacturers and learn from them. And which is great. And I think the flip side is, I think everyone always has an opinion on what you should do. I think it's important to realize that you have to have kind of a gut instinct as well and navigate what makes sense for you and your product and your strengths and weaknesses. Um, there's not a one size fits all, in my opinion. It's just you know, it highly depends on how competitive your category is, your price point, how good the product is and stacks up to others. Uh, and there's just a lot of factors that, and also obviously financing as well, uh, how you're financially backed. 
you may not be able to do things that other people found success in. Um, so I think I've seen a lot in myself where I've had to resist where you, I feel like I'm chasing what other people have done versus what really makes sense for me. But, and the other thing for me is I'm always big on, you know, being able, taking iterative steps that I'm willing to learn and fail from. And my goal is just, you know, I'm going to learn as I go a little bit and not every situation or everything I do is going to be just a success. And so I try to, you know, manage the risk and and be open to failing if needed, but uh, more importantly, learn from that and then use that to take that next step forward and, and just keep pushing forward. Because if you, um, if you think it's always going to be smooth, it, it's definitely not. And so you just have to be willing to take those failures and learn from it and, and use it to, pro- to propel you forward. That's it. Well, That's my two yeah. things. Great. Well, <laughs> I want to thank you again, Michael, for, for your time and for being on this podcast. I'm excited to see where your company goes and to taste the, the future products that you're working on now. Um, so thanks again for being on Water and Food. Thanks for having me. I'm Zachary Cartwright. This is Water and Food. Find this podcast on Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.